Hello everyone, Michael Panisi here, and today we're going to do a deep dive into exclusive right to sell versus a company exclusive. Um, obviously, I did not send out a, a Mother's Day email. I was dealing with kind of what I was dealing with on my end with my kids being sick and whatnot. So I just wanted to wish all the mothers on this call a very happy Mother's Day. I hope you really enjoyed your time and you certainly deserve it. So we started this uh, session with a pop quiz. I'm going to uh, you know, have a spoiler alert here and just skip to straight to the answers. But one of the questions that, that I wanted to ask the group was, what is the goal when we take a listing? And I think that there were a lot of um, answers that came out in conversation, but the primary goal um, is always what is in the best interest of the client? What is the client looking for? So I just outlined a couple of answers that we've received or a few answers, you know, get the seller top dollar, get the house sold as soon as possible, get multiple offers, get the best terms, take an exclusive, sell the listing to your buyer, all the above. The, the truth is, is none of those are the answer. And I know that sometimes that may seem counterintuitive, especially that first one, get the seller top dollar. Not every seller is, is, you know, their number one priority is getting top dollar. Some people want to sell the house yesterday. Um, some people, you know, want certain terms like a use and occupancy or, or you know, various different terms, a like clean out. Um, depending on the needs of the seller is going to dictate the strategy that we take. So the correct answer is and should always be whatever the seller defines as the goal, which is all the more reason why you have to have a conversation with your seller and figure out what their goal is. So we're going to start with the basics, um, and I'm just going to go through the two different types of, of listings. The first one is exclusive right to sell. So an exclusive right to sell, just by definition, is any listing that's actually being publicly marketed on the MLS. Um, they define that as exclusive right to sell. I know it gets a little tricky when it has the word exclusive in it, but just know that anything that says exclusive right to sell is always you know, MLS. A um, couple things that are just you know a few points. Uh, the listing's not valid unless it's completely filled out. Price, the parties, the property, the commission, the dates, the signatures, everything needs to be filled out properly. I can't tell you how many times people leave the, you know, the price off or not all parties sign um, or they just don't put, you know, a proper commencement and expiration date. You need to have all those components for this to be a valid uh, listing agreement. The listing needs to be entered into the MLS within 48 hours um, of the commencement date. This is a big deal because sometimes you're sitting down with a seller today, but they're not looking to actually put their house on the market for a few weeks. Just know that the commencement date is the start of the listing. So if you get everything signed today and the commencement date is three weeks from now, and they happen to have a buyer that reaches out to them, you know, unbeknownst to you and says that they're interested in buying the house tomorrow, and the commencement date doesn't start for three weeks, you are not covered by this listing agreement. That seller could then go out, sell it to that buyer, and they would owe you nothing in terms of commission. Um, the end is also true in terms of expiration date. You know, the expiration date is the end of the contract. So anything before that date, you're entitled to a payment on. Anything after that date, you are not entitled to a commission on. The only exception to that rule is related to broker uh, protection, which is paragraph 11. So you can read it you know, within the listing agreement. And basically paragraph 11 states that you're protected for the buyers that you marketed the property to during the listing period for 180 days after um, the property expires. The only exception to that rule is if that seller goes out and then relists with another company, because then that other broker kind of takes away your broker protection. They wouldn't have to pay that commission twice. Just list off a couple of different components of this that I just you know felt like it makes sense for you to know. Um, first of all, the actual uh, term of the agreement. I don't know why people tend to you know stick to six months. I always got my listing signed at a year. Most sellers have no issue uh, signing off on a year listing. I think that the longer period you have, the more protection you have. Why our, you know, our standard is six months doesn't really make sense to me. I would just suggest that you kind of make a, a business decision to mark all of your listings for one year if you could get away with it. Um, one thing that I do not want to see is any listing that's signed for a month or two months. Uh, there's no reason for that, and it's an immediate red flag in my mind. Um, second thing is we do not deal with sub agents. Sub agents um, refer to agents that also represent the seller from another brokerage in addition to us representing the seller. 
when we take a listing with you know any seller, we are the only brokerage that represents them. So we do not participate with sub agency. Uh, buyer brokers, yes, we do participate, obviously. Um, I really would love to make a point to put out 2.5% minus $25. Um, the market does dictate dictate that to some extent. Um, there are markets where the standard is 2% or 2.25. In those markets, I'm perfectly fine with you being in keeping with the market. But as the market leader, we don't want to set a standard for you know less than 2.5% in the open market and, and you know in many of the markets that we covered where the standard typically is 2.5%. I realize standards are negotiable. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But you guys know, you know, when you look at the MLS, if most of the listings are being put out at two and a half percent, we should be following suit. Um, in fact, we should be leading that charge because it's very costly to us if that number slips, you know, into lower, you know, lower amounts. Um, I do yield to you. You are independent contractors, but, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind because it's not worth, you know, the you know, thousand dollars that you care, you know, you stand to make off of that extra, you know, 0.25% to, you know, degrade the commissions as a whole across the buyer side in our industry. The second thing to that point is subtract an additional $25 for every relist or every, you know, extra MLS that we put it on. Um, I tell you that because the standard's $25. I realize that there are some brokerages that are charging 250 or 500. Don't know why they're doing that. It's not my, uh, um, not not in my charge or in my power to change anything along those lines. What other brokers do, but you know we're the industry leader, and we as a you know as an office and we as a company should maintain that role and should you know just try to elevate the industry as a whole. I think that charging more where there's not an actual fee there is just wrong, and that's just my two cents on that. Transaction brokers, yes, we do participate with them, but I would only offer them out 1% uh, minus $25. The reason why is there's a lot of internet companies out there where they do nothing. They don't show the house. They won't uh, do a home inspection. They literally will just write up the, uh, the offer as a transaction broker. They should get paid less because they're doing less work. Sales commission should never be blank. What I'm really talking to here is rentals. Uh, I cannot even tell you the pain that goes through an agent's mind when their their tenants that they rented out a property to a year ago or two years ago wind up buying the property that they rented them to and they go back to the listing agreement and find that there is no sales commission included in that sale. Um, there should never be a point where a, a, a landlord says no to this. Because if they're saying no, it, it raises an immediate red flag. You know, a lot of times they'll say, well, I'm not selling the house. Why do I have to pay a commission? And my answer to that is very simply, you know, you're not selling the house. That's not a problem. You'll never have to pay this if you don't sell the house. But should you sell this to the tenant that we bring forward, a commission would be due. So you are ultimately the decision maker on that. You don't have to accept that, uh, you know, that offer. Maybe you never sell this property and that's perfectly fine. But if there's a sale that's procured from this tenant that, you know, we're we're bringing forth, there would be a commission due. If the seller, or excuse, I should say the landlord, has a problem with that, you know, I would think for a second why. Maybe they're trying to kind of backdoor into a sale by getting a tenant first. Uh, it happens all the time. I know it's unfortunate, but it's true. So just be careful, protect yourself, always write in the commission for that. The last thing is lockbox is always the preference. I know sometimes sellers, you know, want listing agent to a company. What I would say to you is if you're accompanying all showings, two things. One, there's certainly going to be less showings because people don't want to deal with that. So that's something that that hurts you. And then two, there's a time commitment and, um, you know, uh, there's a lot that goes into doing that from your schedule perspective. If you're going to be giving up more time, you should ultimately be getting more commission on those deals. Um, it usually comes into play with luxury real estate more so than anything else. But in general, I would prefer to have a lockbox on all listings. It's a safer way to show the property. Moving along, um, at least a year and a half, preferably more. This is for the blank section on section eight. What this says is like, buy the property um, that you guys are protected commission wise for a year and a half after that term. Uh, it's a really you know easy way to kind of build in some protection for yourselves. Um, the last point on this is the owner's line where it says if five owners, you need five signatures. I can't stress that enough. We had a situation a couple of years ago where um, it, it was a divorce, but there were two parties on the transaction. Only one of them signed. 
Um, ultimately, they both wanted to sell the property, but they kind of got a gotcha moment because we were under contract about to close and they came back and said, well, both of us didn't sign, so we don't owe you a commission. Uh, don't get caught in that trap. Look at the tax records. Make sure that you have, you know, whoever is an owner of that property is signing off on, on the listing agreement because otherwise you're going to put yourself in a really bad spot later. Um, for page two and for all of the other clauses in the, in the Garden State MLS listing agreement, the exclusive right to sell, we're not legally allowed to change any of that. And I know that sometimes you, especially when we have an attorney who's a seller, they, they say, oh, well, you know, I want to change number 12, the owner's liability. You can't. We're not allowed to change any of that if we want to put the listing on the MLS. Um, it's a standard by which the MLS keeps every single broker, every single seller is kept to the same exact standard. So you're not legally allowed to change any of that. It's, you know, basically it's null and void. It, you know, you're not allowed to put a listing in that has any of that changed. Um, it's against the MLS guidelines as I've written. And the only thing you can modify is the actual blank spaces. And they, they write it up on purpose that way because you're not an attorney. Um, the other thing I want to point out is in terms of the sales commission, this is one point that sometimes you have to go into the margin. Variable commissions is an example of this. So, for example, if you put 6%, you put like a little asterisk, you could put 5.5% if sold by the listing agent. That's something that you would write right into the margin. So that would be the one exception where you're not putting something on a blank space. Um, company exclusive. So this is the other option, and this is you know not MLS driven. This is something that's a listing that's being taken that's not being put on the MLS, at least at this point. Um, again, the listing is not valid until it's completely filled out. Price, parties, property, commission, dates, uh, signatures, everything. One thing that I want to point out on that is when you're dealing with price, you don't have to put like this is not going on the MLS. This is not public, you know, unless the seller you know allows you to make it public. So with that in mind, when you take an exclusive there, it's a commitment to you and to us as a brokerage, Coldwell Banker. You don't have to put a true price on there. If you need just a placeholder, just take a you know put a price that's a million dollars more than what you think the house is worth. So that way the seller knows that you know, you're still discussing price. They're not locking in at a lower number than they necessarily want. And there could still be discussion and some, some due diligence done on that. Um, but at a minimum, there's at least something on this document to make it a binding listing agreement. Uh, that's the easy workaround for that. Um, the commencement date is different on an exclusive than it would be on exclusive right to sell. The commencement date should always be today's date. Because again, it's not going on um, you know, the open market. So even if the seller's not ready to actually market their home or anything along those lines, all you're doing is solidifying the relationship between you and the seller, the brokerage and the seller. Um, the broker protection begins upon the commencement date, hence the reason why you want that date to be today. Um, you get it signed for today, and ultimately what that means is, is you could then go out and, you know, and spend money on the marketing. You could you know, go out and do listing concierge, you get photography, you could go out and do staging if you choose to do staging. You could spend your time and effort to prepare the, pro the property, help the sellers with whatever they need from a decluttering perspective and all that. The, the point is, is you have a legally binding contract with that seller, which gives you the ability to spend all of your time and money to prepare the property. We're going to talk about a couple different terms on this. Um, again, you always need a price. I'm not going to kind of you know beat that drum any further, but make it up if you need to. Minimum of six months. Again, I prefer one year. Lockbox is always the preference. Again, we're repeating ourselves a little bit. 2.5%. Um, I put minus 25 and I said, will it eventually be listed? The reason I stated that is because many times we'll take an exclusive and even if it sells during the exclusive period, the plan is to put it on the MLS later for comp purposes. So, you know, build in that $25 knowing that it's going to go to MLS eventually. And then the last part is the waiver of broker cooperation, which I'm just going to table that because we're going to discuss that in great detail. Sales commission is never blank. Again, this speaks to rentals. Um, minimum of a year and a half uh, years, preferably longer. That's if the tenant were to buy the property. And then that last point on broker protection is not outlined like it is on, um, you know, on a, a an exclusive right to sell. On an exclusive, you actually have to write that in. So write in 180 days. 
There are uh, several other necessary documents. This is for both exclusive right to sell or a company exclusive. First one is the dual agency consent form. You should have that signed every single time because if you don't, as a listing agent, you can't have other Coldwell Banker agents show the property on the sales side. Um, clearly, that's something that the seller is listing with us for. They want to get as much exposure as possible, so they need to sign off on that. Statement of disclosures, um, that's the CIS. It's state law that you have that signed, so make sure that you get that signed in every example. Um, lead paint disclosure, as long as the house was not built um, after 1978. If it was built before 1978, clearly you need a lead paint disclosure. And the last two are the seller's disclosure. This is optional, but the sellers should sign this if they are willing to. Uh, if they're not willing to, have them sign in and just say that they're unwilling to disclose or they have nothing to disclose if they've never lived in the property. The last thing is the transaction form, which is really just an in-house form so we could, could compile and, and actually create the document um, you know, internally. So let's talk about the waiver of broker cooperation. This is specific to a company exclusive. This is an all or nothing document. You can't like sign some of it, but not every, not the rest of it. You got to sign all or nothing. Um, what is what this is saying is during the exclusive period, you have the right to show it to all companies or just to Coldwell Banker. I'm going to take a stand on this one and say that you really should have a waiver broker cooperation signed on every exclusive listing that you take. Um, there are reasons that I'm going to get into as to the why, but if for whatever reason you choose not to have that signed, not a problem, just know that you can't pick or choose which brokerage you allow in. So if you know somebody from the red company wants in and somebody from the yellow company and somebody from the green company, they all want in, you can't pick and choose and say, I'm only going to yet let you know one color, but not another. Um, you have to allow everybody in or no one in. That does not apply to Coldwell Banker because it is a company exclusive. So it is, you know, everybody at Coldwell Banker has the right to see it should your seller decide to allow any showings. Um, one point that I want to make on this, though, is if you're not showing the property, sometimes you take an exclusive knowing that you're going to put it on the MLS in, let's say, two weeks. If that's the case and you're not planning on showing it, you're just, you know, getting your ducks in a row in terms of, you know, getting the, you know, the property ready and all that stuff. Uh, not a problem. You definitely need a waiver of broker cooperation because it's the document that you have to supply to other brokers should they catch wind of this property and want to get access. Um, you have to allow them access unless you have a waiver of broker cooperation. So just make a point to get that signed. So using the right tool for the job, um, this is something that I want to go into a little detail on is why you would use one versus the other. We're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to just take a quick sip of water. So exclusive right to sell. The advantages of exclusive right to sell in MLS listing. Ultimately, and this is kind of an old school thought process, but it's very true. You're going to get the most exposure with um, with the MLS. There's no question about it. That is the best source for exposure. It also feeds out to all the websites, the portal sites, Zillow, TrueYourRealtor.com, ColdwellBanker.com, all the other sites that are out there. The theory behind this is, you know, the more potential exposure, the more buyers, the more offers, the more money to the seller. The second thing is the only way to truly define fair market value is to go on the MLS. Uh, the reason I say that is if you're not on the market, then how do you know what fair market value is? Now, I realize that that may seem like a great thing for a seller, and it usually is. The question is, is like, is fair market value always top dollar? Maybe yes, maybe no, and we're going to get to that. Third thing is it does promote a realtor friendly environment. Naturally, the more that you know, you're know you out there, if everybody decided to put all their listings in the MLS, like it's as realtor friendly as you can imagine because everybody has access to everything. Uh, it does promote competition between buyers. Naturally, if there's more buyers that are you know, seeing the property and uh, have an interest in the property, it will ultimately mean that more buyers will present offers and there'll be more competition between them. And then finally, the best analytics. Um, you're going to get access to the number of clicks on the property online. You're going to see like how many showings they've had, you know, how many repeat showings, how many offers. So from an analytics standpoint, you're going to get more information than you would get with any other approach. There are some negatives with the MLS, um, the disadvantages. Um, you only get one chance at a first impression. So when you come on the MLS, this, this relates to both price and it relates to um, the amount of 
with my daughter knocking on my head above me, so I apologize for that. Um, you get one chance at a first impression, meaning like price, condition, you know, how it shows from a staging perspective. Once it goes out to the open market, if the open market says we're not interested, um, you've, you've really missed your best shot at selling it for top dollar and for the quickest amount of time. Um, ultimately, like you really want to shine when you first come to the market. So that's why I put like the house needs to be, you know, show ready. You don't want to be in stages of decluttering or stages of staging um, prior to coming on the market, you know, or excuse me, when you come on the market, you want to do that prior to coming on the market because ultimately like you have to be ready to show and, you know, show beautifully once it hits the open market. Um, testing the market, this is relates to, as it relates to price, testing the market could destroy uh, your equity as a seller. So really bad decision to test the market. Once you go to the open market, you do that prior to putting it on the MLS. You never test it like during the MLS. I always used to joke around with my sellers that like when they tell me, oh, we kind of want to test the market, I would say not a problem. Test the market in week three or four. You know, in, in week one and two, the first two weeks you come on the market, you have to be priced correctly because ultimately that's what's going to lead you to top dollar. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. Um, you know, and many times you start lower to, to, to get higher when you come on the MLS. Um, seller loses leverage. I know this seems uh, a little counterintuitive because you're thinking, oh, we're going out to the market and we naturally have, you know, a larger buyer pool and all of that. The, the negative to this is when you think about it from the perspective of being an exclusive versus being an exclusive right to sell, company exclusives actually have more leverage because you could always hold the MLS over the buyer's head. You know, and, and I'll give it to you in practice. Like the buyer says, you know, they're not behaving, so to speak, during um, a home inspection. They're asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars. You could always say, like, listen, like, you know, we appreciate the fact that you want all these things, but, you know, if that's the case, rather than, you know, then say yes to all of this to you, we might just take our chances with the MLS and go out to the public market and see how things go. Like that puts a little bit, there's a, there's one more step that the buyer could like kind of fear the competition from um, that ultimately once you're on the MLS, you don't have that leverage. So that's, that's what I'm referring to in terms of that. Um, tick, 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 days on market matter. They, they matter so significantly that, you know, the difference of a week to two weeks to three weeks can mean the difference of, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10%, depending on the market. Um, that's again, why it speaks to first impressions, you know, are so critical when you're talking about exclusive right to sell, uh, timing matters. So that takes a lot of different forms that could take seasonal forms, like when you're coming on the MLS, depending on the season, depending on the weather. Um, it could also take, um, the forms of the day of the week. Like you would never, I would never bring a house on the market on a Sunday, let's say. Because ultimately you're getting, you know, Sunday, you're getting Mondays, the first day, uh, the first day of the week, business day. So if somebody brings you an offer right away on a Monday, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday that you're having showings now. And, you know, attorney review would end before you even get to your first weekend of showings. So ultimately, like from just a, a you know, a strategy standpoint, I usually bring houses on the market on a Tuesday. I delay showings to a Thursday. I allow it to feed out to all the different websites. And then start showings on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Monday would be a three day attorney review period. So ultimately you're giving your seller a full week of, of showings and most importantly, a full weekend of showings. So the timing does matter. Um, access matters. When you're on the MLS, there's an expectation that people are going to get access to the property. If you can't get them access to the property, you're going to get a lot of people upset and you know buyers are going to be less interested in the property without the access that they require. So that's something that you should definitely be uh, you know, uh, mindful of. Ex a company exclusive. There are a lot of different advantages and these are more of talking points that I, I just want to point out to you. Um, it's not that one is more advantageous than the other. It's just that there's different talking points for one versus the other. So I want to kind of touch on all of them. Um, one is probably the biggest thing is you could test the market without penalty. So if a seller says to you they want to be $100,000 higher than where you think the house should be, that's the perfect thing to do during an exclusive. You're testing the market without 
poisoning the well in terms of all of the buyer pool. You're testing the market off market. You're seeing if buyers are you know are interested in biting um, on that you know hundred thousand um, dollar you know increase. And if they're not, then at least your seller knows that they've now tested the market. And it, it wasn't, you know, going to yield what they wanted it to yield. So now, when you actually go to MLS, you could go on on a price that's um, more in keeping with where, you know, fair market value should be or where you believe it should be. There are no days on market. That's that's the part that I said about without penalty because you don't have days on market ticking by, and you don't have like these online trackers like you know Zillow or the Garden State or who, whatever. You don't have them like ringing up days on market. Um, ultimately, there is no tally of that, so that helps you in in an exclusive period. Um, the house does not need to be show ready, and I know that seems again counterintuitive, but. It actually is so true because the the narrative that you could say with a with a, a company exclusive is different than once it comes to the MLS. When you're having you know one-on-one -on -one conversations with a potential uh, buying agent or a buyer related to a company exclusive, you could state like, listen, they're preparing the house for market. They're looking to go on the market a week from now or two weeks from now or whatever it is. You know, they haven't even had the stager come in yet. So ultimately, like you could come out and see the property, but just know that the condition is not what it will be. That dialogue works perfectly fine. When you're on the market, that dialogue doesn't work at all. So, you know, that's something that does not need to be show ready. So if you have a seller who's kind of like, you know, back and forth and hemming and hawing over staging, perfect way to do it would be an exclusive. Um, limited access is more accessible. It's almost like you're doing the buyer a favor by getting them early access to the house. So they're going to be more amenable to do it on the seller's terms naturally than if it was on the MLS where everybody wants to get access. Um, seller retains leverage. This is what I spoke to before. Ultimately, you could always say to that buyer, like, listen, we appreciate your offer, but we're going to take our chances with, you know, the open market. Um, that leverage, that fear of missing out and that fear of competition, future competition, whether it's uh, perception or reality is irrelevant. Like it's very much a reality to that buyer. And many times it keeps them from, you know, asking for things that they would normally ask for. Um, the timing does not matter. Because, you know, ultimately you're not on the market. So, you know, you don't have to worry about days on market ticking up. You don't have to worry about, you know, uh, the, the, the weather, or the day of the week. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff because there's no time frame, you know, expectation that's built in related to an exclusive. Um, so it certainly helps from that perspective. You do get two shots at a first impression uh, with an exclusive because, you know, you could put it out there to all the buyers that, you know, are working with Coldwell Banker, let's say, which is about a third of the market. Uh, so it's, a, you know, it's a decent chunk, but you could put it out to all of them. You could test the market. Let's say for whatever reason, you don't get the reaction you want. Like in that first example, you know, you're testing the market on price and people just don't respond to it. Not a problem. You could always then, you know, correct your price, adjust your price. You could stage, let's say, get the house, you know, ready condition wise, and then go to the MLS. And now you get a second shot at that first impression. And many of those same buyers may come back out now that it's, you know, show ready and everything else. Um, limited showings as it relates to sellers like fears of COVID-19 or privacy concerns. For years, we always would have privacy concerns related to like, you know, think of like exclusive properties. You know, it's the CEO of a company, it's a famous athlete or a, you know, a movie star. They don't want to have everybody that has access to their home. So they would do an exclusive um, for those purposes. It's kind of transitioned a little bit more recently relate as it relates to COVID-19. You know, you have a, a young family. You don't want to have a million people through your house. Sometimes the seller will say like, you know, we're willing to show it, but we want to be a little bit limited on showings. And exclusive is the perfect answer for that. And then the last thing is exclusivity creates urgency. Um, naturally, in a market that has zero inventory and like, you know, an inventory shortage in general, um, what happens is, is buyers want to find something that's off market. It's kind of like that, uh, that velvet rope at the club, like people want VIP access. So knowing that they're going to get, you know, to see a property before the full market sees it uh, is certainly a selling point. And it's something that creates an urgency in the, in the mind of a buyer, because if they don't act now, um, they may risk that, that house going to market and then further competition and, and what have you. The disadvantages of a company exclusive. Um, there's limited exposure. And, you know, it's the it's the opposite of what I said about um, exclusive right to sell and MLS. 
Like when you come on the MLS, it's like, you know, extra, extra, read all about it. It's in every paper. You know, when you're um, as a company exclusive, it's, it's a little bit more word of mouth. It's a little bit more internal in terms of the marketing effort. Um, you know, there are some tools we use, but naturally, like the exposure is a little bit lessened, um, which ultimately leads to limited showings. You're not going to get the masses. You're not going to have lines outside of the door, you know, to show the property. Um, you know, the argument is quality versus quantity. You, you Ultimately, you need one buyer for the house. But the question is, what is the best approach? And in many instances, it depends on the seller that you're talking to. Um, the question that always comes in the minds of those sellers is, could we get more on the open market? And you know, ultimately, there's a risk reward to this. Like some sellers um, take their chances with you know going to open market even after they've received offers during the exclusive period. And I've seen that work out for sellers. I've seen that not work out for sellers. I mean, you know, when you make the argument of where you get top dollar, you know, on the market or you know in an exclusive period, I would say I've seen both sides of it, and there's not a right answer there. And anybody who says otherwise, like really hasn't seen it like I have because on a macro scale, I've seen, you know, in the past couple of years, I've seen 20 plus occasions where people had great offers off market, like as an exclusive, chose to take their chances on the open markets to see if they could get more, ultimately did not get more and why ended up settling for less because that buyer that was willing to pay more during an exclusive period was not willing to pay more in the open market and, and ultimately paid less. So, you know, that's those are examples that you never want to see. You always want your seller to get top dollar. Um, but, you know, there is a risk reward there. They have to make that decision. I also also I have to admit, I've seen the opposite of that where they've gotten more on the open market. So it works both ways. Um, it truly is a seller's decision. I think that, you know, it's it's not a bad thing for the seller to have more information to make decisions. So, you know, there's a positive lining in terms of that. But, you know, that is the question that comes up is could we ultimately get more on the open market? Um, fewer offers, naturally, you know, when you talk about limited exposure, less showings, you're going to get fewer offers. Uh, and it is, you know, a less realtor friendly environment when you're not allowing certain agents in, you're allowing other agents in. So that, that plays a role as well. So before we get into pricing strategy, I'm going to take another quick sip of water. I think pricing strategy is a point that confuses a lot of people. So I, uh, you know, I want you to think about this a little differently. We're going to take it out of context. We're going to do a case study. The case study is an art auction. So let's say, say you're selling this piece of art and you had it appraised. Um, you ultimately believe that the that the price of the, the art is supposed to be about $100,000, you know, give or take, but $100,000 is the mark that you're looking for. So the first uh, scenario is the auction room is full. You have a full house. You have all the people that you wanted in that auction room. The question then becomes, how do you price that um, that piece of art? Do you price the painting uh, you know, at $100,000? Do you price it over $100,000? Or do you price it below $100,000? And if the room is full and you know the auction house is full with the right people that you're you know looking for and you, you've achieved your goal from a marketing perspective, the answer is easy. It's price the painting below $100,000. And, you know, the reason, the why behind that is very simple. You have all the bidders in the room. You let the bidders fight against each other. It's not a back and forth, you know, tug of war between you and the bidders. It's the bidders that are fighting and having this emotional component that comes into play of I want to win. No, I want to win as they battle each other to ultimately get the painting. If you take that strategy with a with a full auction room, it's going to lead to, you know, top dollar for what that painting's worth. And, you know, Hopefully in this instance, it's worth more than $100,000 based on you know, people bidding it up. Second scenario is the auction room is a third of the way full. So you don't have a, you know, a boisterous crowd. You have like a less in, you know, amount of people. And naturally, like with that you know, less amount of people, you have to try to figure out pricing strategy. So three strategies still remain the same. You price it at 100, you price it you know, above or over 100, you price it below 100. In this particular case, I would say that you price it over 100K. And the reason why is, is like with less of a crowd, there's less of a chance for this back and forth, like, you know, pushing the price up. So you have to build in a little bit of room for negotiation. So that's the why behind it. And ultimately it's the, you know, less competition, more negotiation is the, is the theory behind that. Um, if you look at these two strategies, a company exclusive, 
is, you know, that strategy of, you know, a third of the room is full. So you got to price it higher to build in room for negotiation or to try to give yourself a premium knowing there's not going to be that competition. The pricing strategy for exclusive right to sell is a full auction house. Because once you hit the MLS, it's going out to the masses. So you have to let the masses see value and fight over it. Um, just to break it down a little further, exclusive right to sell, auction room is full. Use price to attract buyers. Let the buyers fight each other, not the seller. The one exception to this rule, and there is a very big exception, is dependent on price point. So the higher the price, the smaller the buyer pool. Uh, as you move up that pyramid, as you can see, the buyer pool shrinks further and further. So as that buyer pool is shrinking, there are less people that can afford it. It echoes, the top of the market echoes in an empty auction room. So, you know, if there's only five buyers that could afford that $5 million house, naturally you're not going to get those people to, to bid, you know, outbid each other in most instances, knowing that that's the case. You want to do you know, your due diligence by the seller by pricing in room for negotiation, which is why luxury homes tend to take longer to sell. There's a smaller buyer pool um, and why you don't see like, you know, distress pricing, pricing it below where you feel it's worth um, in the luxury range. The reason why is because it doesn't work like, you know, it's you wind up with less money because there's less competition. So that's just the one exception that I wanted to throw out there. Uh, company exclusive, you got to think that the auction room is a third of the way full because in Coldwell Banker's base, uh, we uh, we have a, like a third of the market share. So, you know, when you're in, in Coldwell Banker's case, excuse me, we have a third of the market share. So naturally, when there's only a third of the market that's, you know, seeing, you know, the inventory, you test higher price points, you let buyers reach to avoid further competition later with the MLS. So that's the strategy there. So questions that commonly come up, we're going to go into, you know, I'm just going to touch on a bunch of different questions that I always get. Um, should our sellers sign a waiver of broker cooperation? And in my opinion, the answer is ultimately yes. Yes, 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 yes. I realize that that may seem self-serving to you, but I could assure you that it's not. This is not about trying to sell both sides of the listing. Um, I tell you that because I don't care whether you take an exclusive or you do an exclusive right to sell. It doesn't matter to me. Do whatever is in the best interest of the seller or do both. And we're going to get to kind of what that looks like in terms of doing both. But I tell you, yes, and I feel very strongly about waiver broker cooperation um, because and this is the why behind it. Like you're missing the point if you're not doing a waiver broker cooperation. The point of exclusivity is to be exclusive. So exclusives are not required. You don't have to you know, take an exclusive. The seller doesn't have to do an exclusive. They can go to market. Like if you're going to choose to, you know, invite other brokers in, go to market and get the benefit of everybody seeing the property, not just a select group of people. Um, number two, I said exclusive by uh, exclusive buyer urgency requires exclusivity. So if you let in, you know, a, a buyer or a buyer's agent from, you know, XYZ real estate company and they know that it's an exclusive, like they're not thinking to themselves that there's exclusivity. Because if there was exclusivity, they wouldn't be there because they don't work with Coldwell Banker. So to them, it's the exact same thing as being on the open market. They're not going to behave differently. The whole point of this is you want buyers to behave differently. You're trying to stimulate a response from them, and the response is urgency. Um, number three, the seller options diminish. So if you think about it, if you're limiting the buyer pool to 33%, then what that leaves you with is if you're testing the market with that 33% and then it doesn't work for whatever reason and you choose to open it up to that bigger pool, you still have that option to open it up to the bigger pool. If you take it as an exclusive and then you kind of shop it around to all the best buyers in the marketplace that are working for every other brokerage, what option do you have left if all of those people have already said no? You've now shot yourself in the foot. Not a good plan. So, you know, that to me is like, a, you know, a very big reason why you shouldn't do that. And then fourth, the seller loses leverage because they can't hold over that buyer's head. Hey, we're going to take it to the MLS. 
because the buyers already know that they've been competing with other brokerages, especially if another broker is the one who sells it. So there's no fear of that in the buyer's minds because they're they're already thinking to themselves, wait a second, I've already competed with other brokerages. Like, what's the MLS? Like, I'm already the top dog in terms of what I brought in from an offer perspective. You lose all leverage. Not a good plan. I would strongly recommend waiver broker cooperation every single time you take an exclusive, uh, a company exclusive. So the second question is, are company exclusives bad for the seller? So this is like a, an old school real estate question because, you know, moral question, ethical, whatever you want to talk about. I learned when I learned real estate, I was always taught don't take company exclusives because they're self-serving and the only they're only in the interest of the, the listing agent or the listing brokerage because you're trying to sell it yourself. And, you know, I've heard that from, you know, from people through the years about I would never take a company exclusive. I think you're thinking about this the wrong way. And, you know, I just want to touch upon, you know, the why. First of all, the answer is no. It's not self-serving to take a company exclusive. In fact, it's very much in the interest of the seller, depending on how you actually do it. So the why behind that is, you know, the first thing is sellers don't have to market or show during an exclusive. So think about that for a second. Like, what the seller's doing by signing an exclusive listing today is you're agreeing that we as a brokerage are, you know, are your choice. You're going to work with us. You're going to work with me as the listing agent. And now you're giving me the, the permission, so to speak, of what I need to go out and spend money and spend time and effort on getting your house to be perfect. Um, I tell you that because, you know, isn't that what you want as the seller? Before you go to market, you don't want it to be this rushed approach where I have to get everything done in 48 hours. No, you want me to do your marketing right. Well, you have to make a commitment to me in order for that to happen. You're not necessarily stating that you have to sign an exclusive and shop it to all a Coldwell Banker. That's still an option that you choose to either explore or not. But signing an exclusive is more about committing to a brokerage so I can go out and do right by you. Um, the second thing is sellers can get offers and still choose to go to the MLS. So if you think about this from the perspective of like, you know, uh, having the most information possible, isn't it a great thing from a seller's perspective to test the market out, see if they can get whatever price they want, get those numbers. Like if they can't get the numbers that they want, like they could still go to market. If they get the numbers they want, now they still have the option to either go to market or choose to actually accept one of the offers. You know, they have their cake and eat it too. They get to make a decision based on what, you know, what they see and, and feel makes the most sense for them. I don't think more information is ever a bad thing for a seller. And then ultimately the seller defines the goal because, you know, if the seller chooses that, you know, we want to go to market, we go to market. If the seller wants to, you know, you know, decide on this is what we want to, you know, accept right now, like they get to choose their destiny. So you're not making decisions for them and they don't have to get forced into or pigeonholed into one option or another. It's their choice. Third question, when should you take a company exclusive? Um, I would say every single time. And I know that, you know, again, like this is not to push exclusives. This is more of like, think about this from a practical perspective. The why behind this is, does every house that you sell look like a model home? Of course not. Most houses need a lot of work and love and care and, you know, due diligence to get it ready for market. So that takes time to do. You need to be protected during that period with an exclusive you know, agreement. Second question is, do you forget like, or excuse me, do you get professional photography for your listings? Of course you do. Like everybody who, you know, is legit in this marketplace is getting professional photography. When you go on that listing appointment, I can guarantee you that your photographer is not waiting in the car to take photos. It takes time to line that up. Usually that's more than a 48 hour period. You get an exclusive signed with the understanding that even if you're going to MLS, it's buying you the time you need to prepare that house properly. Next thing is, is about time. Like, are your sellers ready to show within two days of signing a listing? Almost always the answer is no. So knowing that, like you're also giving the sellers the time they need to do what they need to do for their house. Third or the fourth point rather is, um, do you list houses every day of the week? I talked about that before. If it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you're probably not gonna wanna put the house on the market one of those days. You're gonna wanna bring the house on the market for you know maybe Tuesday, but you know ultimately you wanna start showing it's probably on a Thursday. You don't have to worry about that with an exclusive. You take the exclusive on the Sunday with the understanding that the, you know, the MLS starts on Thursday. Again, it's just a protection and it's just from a practical standpoint, it makes sense. 
The next question is, when should you take an exclusive right to sell? When do you take an MLS listing? Um, and the answer is the same every single time. So I know that that may confuse you and you're like, wait a second, you just said take an exclusive every single time. What about the times where people want privacy or people don't want showings or whatever else? Like you still should take a Garden State MLS if it's on the Garden State MLS or if it's on a different MLS, you know, choose whatever one is specific to that area. But you should do that every single time. Here's the reasons why, like the what behind it. Comp purposes, you want to have the, the MLS ultimately is, you know, is a resource. It's a database for you for the future or for appraisers in the future. You want to have that, you know, that sold reflected in the MLS to make sure that, you know, future sellers get the benefit or future appraisers get the benefit of, you know, seeing that comp. It's a big deal. We want to have all the information in there, you know, as possible. You know, if you talk about market share, like right now, you know, we have 613 houses. This is the, the MLS market share. So we sold 27% more than our next competitor. Now, Hearth Realty just ran an ad on, I think it was on Instagram, where they circled this chart that I put in Matters Magazine. And they said, you know, they were talking about their agent count and how many listings they sold. And they were trying to say that, like, you know, they're, they're doing really well based on their agent count size. And, and kudos to them. I have no problem with that. But what they don't realize that I kind of got a kick out of is even though we show 613 homes sold, that's on the MLS. We have over 850 homes in the last 12 months that we sold, but the others were just not on the MLS and not reflected on the MLS. That to me is a mistake. I think that like when you walk into a listing presentation, it's a nice thing to have market share. We want to be able to show that market share to the best of our ability. Put everything that you sell in the MLS. Then process. So ultimately, like whether you choose to go exclusive and then turn it into an MLS listing later, like is, is up to you and up to the seller. Like, I think that that's a pretty good strategy as you test the market, you see what, you know, you get better information, you make better decisions. So when you go to the MLS, you have, you know, correct information to work off of. But even if you don't go to the MLS, you never go to the MLS, you sell it during the exclusive period. What I would do is I would have the MLS uh, listing agreement signed off on. Um, you could leave the price blank on the MLS listing agreement because what you're doing is you're signing an exclusive. Let's say you sign the exclusive for a year. You could leave the dates and you could leave the price blank on the MLS because you're still protected for that year. If they choose to go to the MLS, you add those two things later. If they don't go to the MLS, what I would do is when the property is about to close, like the day of the closing, I would put it on the MLS, I would mark it active, I'd mark it under contract, I'd mark it sold once it sells. So that way it reflects it in the MLS, you get all the information. Clearly the seller has to sign off on the list price, has to sell off, sign off on you know the, the commencement date and the expiration date. But the cool part about that is, is you've sold the property, but it's also being reflected in the MLS, which I think is really important for, you know, for the marketplace as a whole. Next question, how do I market a company exclusive? Very simple. The first thing you do is an ex is on exclusive look. So you go on C, um, my CV desk, you click on the tile that says exclusive look. Um, once you click on that, it says add listing. You add the listing to that file. Um, this will push out to 90,000 uh, Coldwell Banker agents across the country. So it really does give like a nice boost to try to get people in there. Everybody in New Jersey is going to see it. This is your first step for when you take an exclusive is you put it into exclusive look. Second thing is send an email to the office. Like make sure that, and I don't care, you know, which comes first. Like you could do them both the same day, preferably, but put an email out to our office and let them know what it is that you, you just took and what it is that they have access to if they have access to. It's a really nice thing to do to, you know, to kind of build camaraderie within our office, but also just to take a holistic approach to get the benefit of everybody, you know, seeing the inventory we have. Um, what I would state is this, if you put a sign in the ground, if you send an email about this property, if you put it on Facebook, Instagram, or anywhere else, if you put it on Zillow, any of the channels for marketing, you better make sure that our office is aware of it because I never want to hear that so-and-so took a listing and then didn't push it out to the office, but is doing marketing on it. That's just not the way we operate. I know other brokers do that. That's not who we are. We don't take pocket listings. 
The third thing is, yes, you could do an exclusive and you could still do listing concierge. And I strongly recommend you do listing concierge because for the price point that, you know, it cost us uh, the silver package. I'll use that. That's one of the lowest ones. You know, it cost us eleven hundred dollars. It cost Coldwell Banker eleven hundred dollars. It cost you two eighty nine. You know, the point of it is we're spending a great deal of money to make sure that every single one of your listings is getting exposure. And in doing that, you're getting exposure. Like we want you to get, you know, you and the seller and Coldwell Banker are a united front. The more we're able to market the seller and the more we market you, the more we market our office and our company. Like it's a really nice, you know, uh, you know, uh, trinity there. So knowing that, like put the house through exclusive look, put the house like, or put it into an email, send it out to the office and then do, you know, um, you know, a push on listing concierge to make sure that you get the marketing that you deserve. No pocket listings. That's the biggest thing that, you know, I can't stress enough about this. Like if you have a listing, if it's not being marketed, not a problem, you're just getting it ready for, you know, you know, for the MLS. Awesome. You don't have to tell anybody about it. But if you take an exclusive listing and you don't market it to anybody else in our office and you are marketing it publicly, shame on you, because that means that you're not doing what's best for the seller. You're not doing what's best for our office, for our company. And all you're doing is just you know self-serving and self-dealing is illegal in real estate. So that is just not who we are. Don't do it. How do I market an exclusive right to sell? So first thing is the easiest answer is always listing concierge. That's like a no brainer. You should do it on every single listing you take. Second thing is the Garden State MLS. That obviously is the distinction between, you know, an exclusive, a company exclusive and an exclusive right to sell. So utilize the MLS. Uh, and by the way, it could be any MLS that you're on. Um, the third thing is, is I, I like to speak of, you know, marketing a listing like you would do a grand opening for a store. If you had a retail store or a restaurant that you were opening, you're going to do everything possible to get as many people to that store as you can. That is the approach that you should be taking when you take a listing. You take a listing, you're trying to put it out to the masses, you're doing everything possible to get as many people in the door as you can. You know, whatever you need to do, you have to put signage, you have to do flyers, you have to do internet ads, Facebook, Instagram, you know, what have you, Twitter, do whatever it is you need to do, but get people in the door. That's your job. How do I leverage listings in an inventory shortage? Very simple, leverage. Go on to exclusive first look, you know, exclusive look on CB uh, Homes. And whether you have a listing, you don't have a listing, it's irrelevant. Pull a marketplace that you want to do business, find whatever is exclusive out there, take that listing, look at how many bedrooms, how many baths, what the price point is, and just write a little description, a little teaser, excuse me, a teaser ad, and say like, you know, think about this on Facebook or Instagram, like, hey, guys, like I have, you know, an off market, you know, off MLS, off Zillow property, you know, in Maplewood, four bedrooms, two baths priced at 689. Let me know if you have any interest. Contact me directly. DM me, whatever you want to say. Like what an easy approach. And if you did that every single week, like you do that once a week, twice a week, you know, for for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. If you do that 52 times in a year, if somebody in your you know network that is thinking about buying like and is having a trouble buying or is hearing that it's a, it's a difficult market to buy a property in today's market, what do you think they're going to think of you? They're going to think that you're like the golden goose. You have all the inventory. Like they don't know that you might not have listed any of those properties, but all of those like teaser ads are sucking them in because they realize this is the person, this is the source for houses that are not on the market, that are not on the MLS. It's a no brainer approach to trying to build yourself a reputation for being the source of information. Use it, do that same approach over and over and over again. You're gonna get the benefit of the size and the scope of our office and all the production that we bring to the table. What you can't do is you can't use the property picture, you can't use the address. So just be very cognizant that you're not using those two things because you know ultimately that's what the, the listing agent, you know, that's the benefits of the listing agent. Everything else you could use, if you get permission from the listing agent to use those two things, not a problem. Um, but I would suggest for exclusives especially, you never put out the address, you have them contact you for the address. That's the best uh, alternative for that. 
All right. Um, I really appreciate your time. I'm not going to ask for questions because I'm sitting here by myself, but hopefully I answered all of your questions um, when we were on the call the other day. I hope this uh, you know, re-recording um, gives you all the information you need. Should you have questions that come up, not a problem. Just reach out to me directly. My job is to help you get more listings. My job is to help you understand what is in the best interest of you and the seller, um, depending on their situation. So reach out to me. And um, I really, I wish you guys the best of luck in the, you know, in the, the weeks and months to come. Thank you as always. Take care.